Uh, dear audience, uh, welcome to this uh, seminar of today. Uh, today's uh, topic will be IgG4 related diseases, a very rare and special disease. And uh, the presenter today will be Dr. Giacomo Quattrocio. He is a nephrologist at the San Giovanni Bosco Hospital in Torino, has a great experience in immunological mediated kidney disease and, and especially IgG4 related diseases with uh, also an interest in the kidney injury, of course. Uh, so welcome uh, Giacomo and uh, we will enjoy your presentation. Go ahead. Okay, Th thank you very much, Jack, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thanks uh, to ERCNET for uh, inviting me to speak uh, about IgG4 related diseases. I read the title uh, that uh, uh, puzzled me uh, initially uh, because usually this disease uh, is called IgG4 related disease. But uh, uh, as you will see during my presentation, uh, I think that uh, uh, the plural of this uh, condition is absolutely more precise than uh, the uh, so-called, usually called IgG4 related disease. Uh, this disease uh, is uh, this disease is a weird condition that uh, has been defined uh, by Japanese authors as a, a black crow flying through the dark night. Because these diseases are out there and they affect our patients, but often we are not able to recognize them. Even more, uh, as we have learned in the last years, uh, these diseases may mimic a lot of other diseases, infectious, neoplastic, infective diseases that uh, can involve almost every organ. This is uh, the agenda of my talk. I uh, have just a correct disease with diseases uh, uh, to respect uh, the title, but again, I underline that I absolutely agree with the plural of the definition. Uh, what, is, what are IgG4 related diseases? They are uh, systemic autoimmune mediated conditions that are characterized histologically by tumefactive, tumor like lesions, mass lesions, and histologically by a dense lymphoplasmocytic tissue infiltrate with a predominant of plasma cells that are IgG4 positive. And uh, there is a typical uh, characteristic fibrosis that is called storiform by fibrosis and that we usually can find almost exclusively in IgG4 related diseases. We can find also from an histological point of view obliterative phlebitis and frequently tissue eosinophilia. Oh, sorry for the, for the mistake. Uh, and uh, labs uh, tells us that uh, in about uh, 60, 50 percent of patients we find elevated serum IgG4 concentrations. Here are some uh, historical curiosities. The, the, these diseases uh, were first described in 2001, again from uh, Japanese uh, authors, uh, and uh, who uh, described uh, patients with sclerosing pancreatitis and elevated uh, serum IgG4 concentrations. And they identified uh, this disease as uh, autoimmune pancreatitis type 1. Uh, in the next years, uh, the, almost every organ uh, has been recognized as a possible site of IgG4 related fibroinflammatory diseases. And recently, some uh, old, well known conditions uh, such as Mikovic syndrome, kidney tumor, retroperitoneal fibrosis, Reader's thyroiditis have been included in the great family of IgG4 related diseases. And uh, here comes my first question. How many patients with IgG4 related disease 
have you seen in the last two years? Giacomo, can you see the answer? Probably not, but 98% uh, of the attendees uh, have seen one to three patients and only two have seen four to seven. Okay. Nobody has seen more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, indeed a rare disease. Uh, the prevalence uh, is still unknown, uh, surely because of underestimation, uh, under recognition, under diagnosis. For example, uh, in Japan, the autoimmune pancreatitis uh, went from 8 per million people to 30 per million cases uh, from 2007 uh, to uh, 2016 because of a major awareness and a, a more uh, widely diagnosis. Uh, the uh, male to female ratio is variable depending on the organ involved, uh, so is the age. We uh, usually see uh, in some forms of the disease, uh, of these diseases, elder or older people, but also children have this disease. Personally, to uh, Give you to give you uh, my and our experience uh, after uh, the uh, first years of uh, our experience in IgG4 related disease. In the last two years, uh, I checked uh, just yesterday uh, about 10 patients have been referred to our center, uh, but still, uh, these underlined. Uh, the, the, the fact that this disease is really very rare. Uh, I have always got the feeling that uh, IgG4 related disease was not a unique disease. That's why I agree with uh, the, the term, the title of IgG4 related diseases. Because, in my opinion, but not also in my opinion, very recently uh, a, a great effort has been done to try to identify these diseases uh, have been identified uh, including in a worldwide study that included nearly 800 patients. Uh, uh, this work, this uh, huge work, uh, has allowed to identify four different phenotypes. Uh, for each phenotype, uh, nearly 20 to 30 percent of patients uh, are uh, included in every group. So we can see uh, these four groups that uh, have uh, only, in my opinion, but not only in my opinion, and uh, only the histologic pattern that unifies these so different uh, people. For example, in group one, we see uh, prevalently patients with pancreatic biliary disease who are usually white, old male and present elevated serum IgG4 concentration, slightly elevated Ig. They are very responsive to steroid treatment and usually have a disease involving pancreas and biliary tract, about, uh, as I said, uh, 15 to 25 percent of patients present uh, are included in group one, on phenotype one, if you want. Uh, the phenotype two uh, include patients with retroperitoneal aortitis and periaortitis. Again, they are prevalently old, wild male, uh, but in these cases, in these patients, uh, serum IgG4 are usually no or little elevated. They have uh, high uh, level of erythrocyte sedimentation rate on C-reactive protein, protein, uh, but they are characterized by a more fibrotic disease and a uh, scarce response to treatment with high 
hemolytic glucocorticoids in the history. In these patients uh, have the disease affecting usually pericardium, heart, aorta, retroperitoneum, and metastasis. Uh, different are the group three patients that are usually female, Asian, and younger with a history of atrophy and very elevated uh, serum levels of IgG4. Uh, they usually they frequently present fibrotic disease and have a refractoriness to treatment uh, and uh, the disease usually affects head and neck organs in particular orbits and retroorbital uh, organs uh, meninges ear and thyroid and pituitary gland and uh, finally uh, the fourth group uh, the four the phenotype four uh, is the, uh, that of the so-called Mikelich syndrome, but with the systemic involvement and affects usually uh, old male, uh, is characterized uh, differently, uh, a little differently from the other uh, three phenotypes by very elevated IgG4 levels, elevated Ig levels, uh, presents with a high uh, activity uh, at the beginning, uh, IgG4 related disease uh, responder index is uh, a, an index that uh, uh, categorizes uh, the activity of the uh, disease, and they are usually treatment responsive in the first states, uh, state, uh, in the first uh, uh, moments of the, their uh, disease. Usually, uh, we can see patients with uh, a lacrimal and salivary glands involvement. Uh, sometimes pancreas, but we as nephrologists are allocated, are here, can found uh, at the site here, because the kidneys, the, um, the most frequent uh, kidney involvement, uh, that is uh, tubular uh, interstitial nephritis, uh, is allocated, is found most frequently in these four phenotypes. Uh, we, uh, I have to underline that uh, uh, in the literature, um, the uh, multi-organ involvement of these IgG4 related diseases uh, is uh, in about is described in about uh, 60 to 90 percent. Even if personally we sometimes see some patients with an isolated organ involvement. Going to the desk, uh, from the desk to the bed. Here uh, you can see uh, uh, the uh, PC scan uh, uh, of, a, uh, of one of our uh, recent patients, a 63-year-old woman who underwent pancreatic resection for suspected cancer. Histology actually revealed, of course, an IgG4 related disease and histology uh, uh, that uh, uh, allowed the diagnosis of acute autoimmune pancreatitis. Uh, that uh, is, uh, and this is an example of phenotype one. You know, again, pancreatic resection, that black crow I mentioned in my first slide. This uh, relatively young woman had her pancreas uh, resected uh, because of a curable, treatable in, in disease. But the black cloud was there and we couldn't recognize it. Here is another of our patients, a 17-year-old girl presenting with proptosis who underwent excisional biopsy of this retroperitoneal, retroorbital, sorry, this retroorbital mass histology showed a group 3 phenotype of IgG4 related disease and up to now I saw her uh, last week, uh, she after uh, having uh, received a little course of steroids is in not, is uh, inactive without treatment, but uh, under strict uh, control. And here is uh, another uh, of our patients that uh, we were referred with, uh, a 75-year-old man 
that, that underwent a, a diagno diagnostic workup lasting one year. Uh, and uh, uh, thinking uh, I can uh, uh, understand the difficulty seeing this MRI uh, under the, uh, the, the liver uh, with this uh, disordered mass lesion uh, that uh, it could be very difficult to, uh, to get a diagnosis. But after one year of workup, the diagnosis was as you can see, IgG4-related sclerosis mesenteritis uh, that uh, we include uh, in, in phenotype 2. But we are nephrologists. So what about kidney disease? Well, uh, renal involvement and IgG4-related diseases is absolutely uh, proteiform, and uh, it may be direct or indirect. It is found in about 15% uh, of patients who can present uh, tumor-like radiologic lesions affecting the kidney or the pelvis, tubal interstitial nephritis, membranous or uh, more rare uh, glomerulonephritis, retroperitoneal fibrosis, and this is an indirect involvement of the kidneys, and are described some uh, curious uh, lesions such as renal cysts or a form of IgG4 positive, IgG4 negative IgG4 related kidney disease. Let's have a look at uh, the clinical presentation of uh, presentations of IgG4 uh, related kidney disease. The disease uh, usually affects male patients. Uh, uh, with the average age of 65 years, and they may present with acute or progressive chronic renal failure, uh, sometimes with edema, uh, uh, or uh, they can uh, come to our, uh, to our uh, attention because of the incidental finding of renal mass lesions. But they can also have no or mild systemic symptoms, and frequently, uh, the patients with uh, IgG4-related kidney disease have multi-organ involvement. How can laboratory investigations help us? Uh, we find very often polyclonal hyperglobulinemia, hypergamma globulinemia uh, in almost the totality of cases. And in two-thirds of cases, we uh, can find elevated serum IgG4 levels, or uh, if uh, the IgG4 levels are normal, we can uh, increase the sensitivity of uh, our uh, laboratory, uh, calculating the ratio of IgG4 to IgG, that must be more than 10%, or IgG4 to IgG1, that must be over 24%. In two-thirds of patients, we find severe hypocomplementemia, C3, and frequently also C4, that in, uh, at the beginning uh, could be uh, differentiated uh, from uh, systemic lupus erythematosus or cryoglobulinemia. The same, in two-thirds of cases, we have elevated IgE levels. In about half of the cases, uh, systemic uh, eosinophilia, and in one third of cases of patients, uh, anti nuclear antibodies and rheumatoid factors. Uh, as uh, we have already seen, patients uh, can present with acute or rapidly progressive renal failure, or they can present proteinuria, usual, usually tubular proteinuria uh, in the great majority of cases, or hematuria. Uh, an uh, interesting, uh, recently described uh, laboratory investigation is uh, the uh, measure of circulating plasma blasts that uh, uh, represent, uh, they seem represent a really useful biomarker of disease activity. And they are useful, uh, useful at the beginning, uh, at the initial diagnosis, when the patients have, uh, have still not received any treatment. But uh, unfortunately, 
there are very few laboratories that can uh, measure them. What about radiology in IgG4-related kidney disease? Uh, and here comes my question number two. Which radiologic imaging do you use for the diagnosis and follow-up of patients in general and of IgG4-related kidney disease patients? Okay, all attendees can vote. We will close in five seconds. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is quite an even distribution. 25% of the attendees uh, uh, selected uh, CT, 38% MRI, and 38% PET CT. Okay, par condicio. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, we can study the kidneys and uh, uh, the, our patient uh, by ultrasonography, computer tomography, of course, magnetic resonance, and positron emission tomography, as all of you have underlined. Uh, these, uh, the, the choice of uh, the kind of imaging uh, is uh, depend on the type of lesion and of course and on the type of uh, renal function if possible a ct scan of the chest of the abdomen and the pelvis should always be obtained in all patients diagnosed with igg4 related disease to evaluate the extent of the disease and recently as uh, uh, about one third of uh, you have answered uh, PT, PT has emerged both as a diagnostic tool and for monitoring therapeutic response and guiding interventional treatment. In our experience, uh, we uh, at the, the uh, initial diagnosis, if uh, uh, there are uh, no contraindication, no problem, uh, send every patient to have a uh, positron emission uh, tomography because uh, sometimes uh, it can be difficult uh, to have uh, an organ biopsy uh, if uh, the organ involved is prevalent, prevalent with the uh, periaortic tissue. But with the PET, we can uh, find other organs uh, more easily uh, biopsable. Uh, here are the more frequent uh, radiologic uh, pictures that we can observe. Uh, multiple low density lesions, uh, kidney enlargement, mass lesions, sometimes thickening of the pelvic wall, and uh, of course in the retroperitoneal fibrosis, encasement by inflammatory and fibrotic tissue. Uh, have been reported also cystic lesions and uh, diffuse and focal infiltration. Here uh, we can see uh, multiple low density lesions, uh, bilateral low density lesions in the kidneys. Uh, the same lesions, uh, we, uh, you can observe the same lesions in one of our patients, a uh, uh, 68 year old priest that uh, underwent uh, in uh, two years uh, before uh, coming to our observation, left nephrectomy for a suspected renal tumor. Uh, a, again, uh, after we uh, biopsied uh, the uh, remnant uh, right kidney, we could uh, uh, make a diagnosis uh, of tubular interstitial nephritis. And again, this is that black crow patient with uh, a nephrectomy because of uh, the uh, unawareness of this possibility. Here is the ultrasonography or imaging of another patient uh, with hydronephrosis uh, due to IgG4 related periaortitis and retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, the ultrasonography is the, the first uh, 
uh, in radiologic investigations, uh, these patients came to the emergency room with uh, a bilateral uh, mm -hmm. loin pain and uh, the ultrasonography showed this uh, picture. Uh, the CT scan uh, showed uh, this uh, periaortic inflammatory and retroperitoneal tissue and the MRI confirmed uh, a, a parenchymatous periaortic tissue and confirmed the bilateral hydronephrosis uh, with uh, this IgG4 related kidney disease uh, um, caused by retroperitoneal fibrosis. And finally, uh, here you can see the uh, PET scan of the same patients showing a high metabolic activity in the periaortic tissue, uh, confirming that this was still a prevalently inflammatory phase of the disease and allowing us to give him the treatment. And here you can see uh, another uh, of our patients that uh, we uh, absolutely recently uh, biopsied uh, uh, the same uh, the same presentation, clinical presentation. Uh, the patient, a uh, 63 years old male, came to the emergency department with uh, a bilateral loin pain, and uh, the ultrasonography showed bilateral hydronephrosis, and the CT showed this periaortic tissue that was a biopsid and uh, uh, I, I went with uh, the radiologist that uh, is really a good radiologist that uh, managed to uh, pass near uh, the vertebra and uh, near the aorta under the uh, right uh, renal artery and uh, was able to pick a sample that allowed us uh, to uh, make the diagnosis. And uh, as regard as this biopsy comes my question number three. Which organ do you use, usually choose for diagnostic biopsy? Okay, please make your choice. Five seconds left. Okay, so 43% of the attendees choose the lymph nodes, 6% the pancreas, 41% the kidney, and 10% the periaortic tissue. Okay, thanks. Uh, this uh, is uh, what I uh, expected because uh, uh, the lymph nodes usually are uh, uh, more easily uh, biopsy, are more uh, reaching, uh, reach the bio biopsy, but the pancreas is very difficult. The kidney, if we have a, a kidney involvement and the periotic tissue, or you have really a radiologist test that we have here in our center, uh, able to do uh, this kind of biopsy or uh, it can be very difficult uh, as a needle biopsy. You um, can, uh, you must sometimes do a open biopsy but is a very great uh, surgical uh, procedure. Uh, the problem of the uh, lymph node biopsy is that uh, base, uh, to base uh, also on uh, lymph node histology, the, uh, the diagnosis uh, sometimes is uh, not so good because the lymph nodes can have very frequently uh, fiber inflammatory infiltrate and IgG4 positive infiltrate. Uh, but uh, this does not always mean that we uh, are in front of an IgG4 related diseases. Uh, what are the pathological features that we find when we are able to have one uh, biopsy of the, a sample, an histologic sample of uh, an organ? Uh, in IgG4-related kidney disease, the 
first, the most frequent uh, in involvement uh, is a true interstitial nephritis. Uh, that is characterized as for uh, the other organs by a dense tubular interstitial lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate uh, with a predominance of IgG4 positive plasma cells and plasma blasts and characterized, characterized by the characteristic story for fibrosis. Differently from uh, other organs, uh, we can find rarely obliterative phlebitis or eosinophils infiltrate. Uh, perhaps for the uh, little size usually of uh, the renal sample uh, that uh, do doesn't allow to, uh, to find uh, the obliterative phlebitis that is described, for example, in surgical samples of uh, um, period of uh, uh, pancreatitis. Here uh, you can see the uh, described uh, prominent cellular infiltrate, interstitial filtrate in the renal biopsy of one of our patients. You can see the cellular lymphomonocytic infiltrates here, here, and here is the same infiltrate at higher magnification dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltration, really dense. And uh, here is the immunohistochemical staining showing IgG, IgG's only positive plasma cells infiltrating the renal tissue. And uh, here, the uh, infiltration of IgG4 positive plasma cells. To make a diagnosis of uh, uh, IgG4-related tubular interstitial nephritis, we must have more than 10 IgG4-positive plasma cells for high power field, or uh, a ratio of IgG4-positive over two IgG-positive plasma cells more than 40%. Uh, deflammation infiltrate often uh, spreads outside the renal parenchyma. And here you can see a, a huge pericapsular infiltration in the same patient, accounting for a second organ involvement with abundant IgG positive plasma cells and a great number of IgG4 positive plasma cells. And now, at last, the peculiar so-called storiform fibrosis. I, uh, in, uh, at the beginning, I always uh, was uh, asking myself, but what is this storiform fibrosis? And this is a, a, a kind of fibrosis characterized by a swirling pattern of fibrosis, swirling pattern of fibrosis that resembles somehow the spokes of cartwheel with spindle cells radiating from the center. The same picture at higher magnification, this swirling pattern with somehow this cartwheel appearance. Immunofluorescence studies reveal immune complex deposition in the peritubular membrane space, in the peritubular basement membrane in more than 80% of patients. Here, uh, you can see one of our patients showing uh, positivity, granular staining, uh, positive granular staining for IgG and C3. The second type of IgG4-related kidney disease is membranous glomerulonephritis that uh, is uh, described in uh, uh, about 8-10% uh, of patients and is usually anti-phospholipase uh, A2 uh, receptor negative. <clears throat> Other rare glomerulonephritis are described such as IgA, endocapillary proliferative, membrane, membrane proliferative and mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. As we have already seen, uh, an indirect involvement of uh, the kidneys is by retroperitoneal uh, fibrosis and periaortic 
uh, fibrosis, periaortic uh, size uh, involvement. Uh, here uh, you can see uh, a surgical, in this case it was uh, one of our first patients uh, and uh, we weren't able to have a needle biopsy, so we uh, had the necessity to, uh, to have a surgical biopsy and uh, you can see the positive thing that we had a lot of material. And here uh, is uh, still even more clear the swirling pattern and the cartwheel appearance of the fibrotic tissue and of uh, the um, lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. The infiltrating cells are uh, uh, plasma cells, CD138 positive, uh, and uh, they were very numerous, more than 50 per high power field, uh, most of which were IgG plasma cells, and uh, almost uh, all of them IgG4 positive plasma cells. Sometimes uh, are described uh, only as a curiosity. Uh, renal cysts uh, are reported uh, as a, a possible uh, rare uh, manifestation uh, with other organ involved, but if this report uh, is uh, really a typical, a particular um, IgG4 related uh, um, localization uh, needs further confirmation. And finally, uh, a few cases of, as I told uh, uh, in some slides ago, of IgG4 negative, IgG4 related disease have been described. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 patients with a histologic picture uh, with the characteristic storiform fibrosis, characteristic lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, but with uh, negative or a few uh, IgG4 positive plasma cells. Is histology sufficient for the diagnosis? Of course not. Diagnostic criteria that uh, have been uh, described uh, Utilize uh, uses uh, uh, histologic, radiologic, and serologic uh, findings, uh, he, and uh, uh, the same workup has been made by uh, Japanese and American authors, uh, so that uh, a, a diagnostic algorithm uh, has been proposed uh, that concerns. Uh, to identify uh, definite IgG4 related kidney disease or probable or suspected IgG4 related kidney disease or unlikely uh, IgG4 related kidney disease based on the presence of histology, radiology, and clinical findings. At last, at the end of 2019, the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism uh, published the definite classification criteria for IgG4 related diseases. We should correct the title of this, uh, uh, of this uh, paper uh, based upon four steps. Uh, entry criteria, exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria, and uh, a final calculation uh, to a score that uh, should be more or equal to 20. Let's have a look at, at this apparently complex algorithm. First of all, we have to identify clinical, radiologic, or histologic findings compatible with the diagnosis. If we find this uh, pattern, we sorry, we have to uh, have to go to the step two that uh, ask us to exclude clinical, radiologic, or uh, histologic items that uh, are uh, usually indi indicative of other diagnosis. The third step 
begins from histologic characteristics of which you can see uh, how much way uh, lymphocytic infiltrate and storiform fibrosis have together with IgG4 positivity. After going through these three steps, uh, we have to calculate uh, the final score and we can do, we can make, sorry, uh, a, a definite classification of IgG4 related disease if entry criteria are met, no exclusion criteria are present, and the total points is measured or equal to 20. Now, let's say a few words about pathophysiology. The exact pathogenetic mechanisms of IgG4 related disease are not yet fully understood. What do we know at the moment? Uh, oliglon oligoclonal expansion of B and T lymphocytes, namely IgG4 plasma blasts, and a particular uh, family uh, of lymphocyte T CD4 positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes are present in the blood and in the tissues of patients with the disease. These cells are perhaps activated by unknown antigens. Here are the four antigens up to now described. Interact each with the other and produce elaborate cytokines, interleukin-1, interferon gamma, TGF-beta, and enzymes, perforin, renzyme, and granulizine that we can find in the tissue when we go to study the histology, the same histologic samples, that may drive the inflammatory, the fiber inflammatory process. Furthermore, follicular T helper cells, CD, uh, T4, CD4 follicular helper cells, uh, sorry, uh, helper 2 cells, appear to play a role in uh, orchestrating the switch to IgG4 that uh, typifies uh, this disease. Finally, let's talk about treatment. Glucocorticoids represent the first line of therapy of remission induction in both IgG4-related disease and IgG4-related kidney disease. Usually, prednisone at the dosage of 0.6 mg per kilogram or 30 to 40 mg per day is the initial treatment proposed by the international consensus guideline statement in 2020, in 2015. But steroids can get a good response in inflammatory stages, not in fibrotic stage. Uh, recurrent or uh, with no response, refractory cases are common and steroids, steroids have the, uh, a, a huge number of adverse effects that we all know. And uh, here is my last question. What is your second line treatment in relapsing IgG4-related disease? Okay, please uh, cast your vote. Choices between the second course of steroids, anti CD20 agents like rituximab or DMARTs. We have five seconds left. Okay. 88% choose anti-CD20 agents, 7% the second course of steroids, and 5% the DMARTs. Great, we are really in 2021. Okay, uh, a, a number of steroid sparing agents have been used in uncontrolled studies, but uh, their efficacy has not yet been demonstrated. Uh, lastly, as uh, the majority of you have answered, uh, Anti-CD20 therapy has proven uh, to be effective as remission-inducing agents, even administered without steroids, into doses usually of one gram each, 15 days apart. 
but there is also a but with rituximab anti CD20 because uh, if not uh, uh, put in maintaining therapy, about one third of patients uh, described here relapsed. What is our experience? We reported our preliminary results in 2000, uh, in 2016. Uh, then in uh, 2018, we uh, published our extended experience, the first five patients with IgG4 related kidney disease. And finally, in 2020, we updated our report on immunology research. In patients with aggressive disease, two immune suppressive agents acting synergistically are usually more effective than one. So, based on our experience in severe SLE patients with nephritis, with nephritis we treated four out of five igg 4 related kidney disease patients with an intensive B-cell depletion therapy consisting of a combination of four plus two infusions of rituximab, of rituximab, two pulses of cyclophosphamide and intravenous plus oral steroids that were stopped uh, in four months. Three patients had IgG, uh, had uh, tubular interstitial nephritis and two retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, one of patients with tubular interstitial nephritis wa was not administered cyclophosphamide because of a previous uh, cancer. Uh, we observed at four years positive results, uh, in particular, substantial persistent increase in glomerular filtration rate and a definite improvement in immunologic, radiologic, and histological parameters. Here are GFR. IgG, IgG4, C3, C4, and of course CD20 lymphocytes. And here are histologic improvements at one year of the cellular infiltrate of fibrosis because after one year we rebiopsied our patient to see what happened in the kidneys and we saw a net reduction of cellular infiltrate and fibrosis a net reduction of IgG4 positive plasma cells in the first patient from 40% to 4%, the same reduction of cellular infiltrate and fibrosis in the second patient, and the same reduction of IgG4 positive plasma cells infiltration from 60 to 2%. And here are the radiologic findings in the first patient with IgG4-related retroperitoneal fibrosis periaortitis, showing a net reduction of periaortic tissue uh, already after five months. Two last slides to underline that based on the hypothesized pathogenetic mechanism Several targeted therapies will probably become available in the next few years. Some of them are already uh, included in randomized trial, as uh, uh, for inebilizumab, in which uh, trial we are involved as a center. But let's summarize. IgG4 related diseases are rare protein conditions. Awareness of these diseases is necessary if we want to make an early diagnosis and start an early treatment. Uh, when we nephrologists see IgG4 related, uh, see an acute or progressive renal failure or a, a huge proteinuria or a particular radiologic lesions, we have to raise red flags. Treatment is still a work in progress. In our experience, really small experience, the unintensified and intensive protocol seems to be effective and relatively safe. So, if we become aware of IgG4-related diseases, the black crow will no longer fly through a dark night. 
but will be able to early recognize it in a bright light and to catch it and to treat it. Thank you for your attention. And now I'd be glad thank to you. answer your questions if I'm able to, of course. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Giacomo, for this uh, nice presentation. And indeed, we have uh, we have uh, uh, some time for questions. And one question which was posed uh, uh, is uh, whether there are phenotypes of IgG4 related diseases which have a more chronic presentation and do not need treatment. Usually, the uh, phenotype number three, as uh, I presented uh, one of our patients, uh, if uh, we uh, go through a, a retroorbital or salivary uh, gland involvement and uh, we uh, make the diagnosis, uh, there is no uh, the need uh, of start immediately uh, steroid treatment. Uh, even because uh, usually uh, they are uh, young girl uh, that uh, may require sometimes uh, uh, the starting of treatment because of uh, enlargement, progressive enlargement of their uh, salivary gland, gland of uh, symptomatic uh, salivary gland, gland enlargement or for aesthetic reasons. But uh, if there are no uh, compression, uh, usually uh, the literature uh, tells us not to start immediately. Okay. In the other cases, uh, phenotype uh, 1 and 3, periartitis and pancreatitis, uh, the sooner the better. Okay, then another question is if uh, the finding of granuloma formation on tissue biopsy excludes a diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Yes, I, I can hear, but I didn't hear the question. Okay, so the question is if the risk of granuloma. Yes. Hello? So the question is if the risk gr gr granuloma formation, whether that excludes a diagnosis of IgG4 disease. Uh, okay, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, in uh, the uh, differential diagnosis with IgG4 related disease, the granulomatose appearance is a, a, an issue that must be thoroughly considered uh, because uh, if uh, the clinical and histologic uh, patterns uh, shows uh, a, a possible vasculitic or vasculitic or other kind of uh, involvement or, of uh, disease uh, such as uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, that can have uh, elevated IgG4 infiltration uh, of plasma cells uh, is not per se a, a, an exclusion criteria, but uh, it must be uh, very thoroughly considered with the pathologist and if the other radiologic, uh, clinical, and uh, if any other uh, organs can be biopsied, uh, pushes uh, towards an IgG4-related disease. In particular, uh, we can see the a, a usual typical uh, histologic patterns in eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, that is, uh, the most frequent vasculitis that uh, share some common histologic uh, uh, findings with uh, IgG4 related disease or uh, multicentric Casterman disease. Uh, the, if the granuloma is found in the lymph nodes, uh, in the, uh, it should not be considered uh, as a, a highly sensitive uh, finding orienting towards uh, an IgG4 related diseases because, as I said uh, in, at the beginning, uh, the lymph nodes are uh, the less representative organs to be biopsied for making a correct and definite diagnosis. Okay. 
So uh, another question is, if there is a place for plasma exchange therapy? Uh, in uh, uh, at my uh, knowledge, uh, I have uh, um, I have um, I don't have uh, find uh, any reports of plasma exchange. Uh, I I can only guess uh, that uh, if we uh, find a very very high uh, serum IgG4 levels and a multi-organ involvement that is not uh, I don't can't I can't understand why but our patients uh, are not so uh, systematically uh, systematically involved as uh, the literature uh, underlines uh, but uh, if I uh, should uh, if I uh, meet uh, a, a patient with a really progressive uh, uh, systematic disease with high uh, IgG4 levels, uh, serum IgG4 levels, uh, this I, uh, could be uh, one uh, situation. Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I I some I missed some of your answers, but maybe it's it's my phone. So um, we we go for the last question. Uh, so uh, the the question is if you have a patient with let's say multisystemic lesions, high plasma IgG levels, uh, uh, a, a dense infiltrate in the biopsy. I but negative staining for IgG4 on the biopsy. Um, I can't hear you. Okay. I think there's a problem with the connection. I so I can hear check. Um, yes. Yes. Check. Oh, yeah. So, um, Stephanie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I can also not hear Giacomo very. Okay. Your voice goes go away. Goes away. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we have a problem with connection. I think. So, so uh, I think for also in view of the time, we just uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I thank the audience for listening, and I would like to draw the thank attention you. to the upcoming webinars on 7 December on hypertension, and on January 18 on uh, rare kidney diseases and pediatric nephrology. Again, thank you very much, Giacomo, for this uh, interesting presentation and uh, I wish you all uh, 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 a safe uh, uh, end of the year going into December. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jack. The same to you and thank you to all the listeners. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye. Bye-bye.